Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom is the best dinosaur movie named after a Minecraft song. It's been four years since the first trailer came out. Four years since I made this garbage clickbait video to resurrect my YouTube channel. 2022 will finally see the release of the next one, Jurassic World Dominion. Supposedly the final installment in this trilogy of Jurassic World movies. Although we all know that in this current Hollywood landscape, no franchise ever actually ends. What I find interesting though, is that the Jurassic franchise has not been completely dormant within those four years. There is of course, the Netflix cartoon Camp Cretaceous, which I will not talk about because I have no interest in watching even a single episode of that show, because a random cartoon spin-off TV show should not be considered mandatory viewing to understand the story of a live-action mainline movie series, and because the outlandish ideas that an exaggerated cartoon show provides should not be considered obligatory canon for the live-action movies either. But what I am interested in is the live-action short films we got in the time between Fallen Kingdom and Dominion. Technically, this is not the first time a modern Hollywood blockbuster franchise has released a live-action short film on the side. For several years, the Marvel Cinematic Universe used to have these short films called Marvel One-Shots as add-ons on their DVDs and Blu-rays. But that's the important thing. You can only watch the full thing on the respective DVD and or Blu-ray. The official Marvel YouTube channel might upload previews and ads for those, but not the full short films themselves. Other franchises have released short films on their official YouTube channels as part of marketing for an upcoming movie. 20th Century Fox did it with Alien Covenant and Warner Brothers did it with Blade Runner 2049. These short films mostly serve to set up characters and story elements and thus were basically an extension of the first act of the respective movies. What all the short films of these franchises have in common is that they look relatively small scale in budget. Obviously, they're not cheap either, but what I mean by that is that most of the budget seems to be spent on just getting all these actors of the movie to reprise their roles. While the sets themselves are either minimalistic or just already pre-existing sets built for the movie itself. There's also usually not much happening besides characters talking and interacting with each other, which also keeps the budget down. After all, why would a movie company spend too much money on something that is basically just another piece of advertisement that they upload onto YouTube for everyone to watch for free? In fairness to Blade Runner 2049, it looks like it definitely spent the most amount of effort and budget on its promotional short films. One of them is even a 15 minute long anime that looks pretty good. In unrelated news, Jurassic World also had a bunch of animated shorts uploaded to their official YouTube channel, but it's an unappealing looking motion comic with stiff animation and a storyline that doesn't add anything new. Did you ever wonder what happened in that montage at the end of Fallen Kingdom where dinosaurs were roaming populated areas? Well, the Mosasaur shows up at the beach and leaves. The T-Rex shows up at the zoo and leaves. This motion comic thing is a complete waste of time. And this is why I find Battle at Big Rock fascinating. While it is chronologically set after the events of Fallen Kingdom, it is a completely separate story featuring human characters that are not going to appear in Dominion at all. With a completely new set piece and completely new dinosaur models that had to be built from scratch. And yet are given the same amount of effort as if this was a scene that was actually part of a big budget Hollywood movie. When this short film was first announced, it was said to be shown in theaters in front of Universal's other big franchise, Fast and Furious Presents Hobbs and Shaw. I think up to this point the only studios that do unconnected short films in front of their theatrical movies are animation studios, like Disney and Pixar. So this would have already made Battle at Big Rock a novel concept. I hope no Jurassic World fan was desperate enough to actually pay money to go watch Hobbs and Shaw in the cinema solely for the short film. Because the Fast and Furious movie ended up being released without any Jurassic World film attached. The short film actually premiered on a TV channel and then, in a truly surprising turn of events, Universal uploaded this entire 10 minute short film on their official Jurassic World YouTube channel for everyone to watch for free. They're not even running any ads on it. Even Disney and Pixar do not make their animated short films that easily available to the public. You need to buy a certain Blu-ray or at the very least a subscription to Disney+. Plus. And that is why I think Battle at Big Rock is unprecedented for modern Hollywood franchises. Now that I have told you how we got to this short film, 
I have to tell you how we got to the plot of the short film. Which means I have to complain about the plot of Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom once again. <laughs> One thing I wanna make absolutely clear. I have nothing against the premise of wild dinosaurs roaming the countryside and people having to live with them. In fact, I always thought this is what Primeval should have eventually become, especially after the finale of series 5 exposed anomalies and prehistoric animals to the public. I love the premise, I just hate everything about how this was set up in the Jurassic World franchise. People coexisting with wild dinosaurs is something Trevorrow has talked about back in 2015 when the first Jurassic World movie came out. And it was the one thing I was looking forward to the most in the sequel. That's another problem with Fallen Kingdom. It wastes an entire movie's runtime on first retreating the Lost World and then retreating the whole military hybrid thing. And only the final 10 minutes set up the most interesting plot point, dinosaurs on the mainland. And they do it in the most frustratingly stupid way possible. First of all, I don't care how many excuses you wanna make for Maisie releasing the dinosaurs without thinking of the consequences, fact is, she is the one who pressed the button. So I will blame her and Claire for every single casualty that results from a dinosaur that originated from this room specifically. Which does include the Allosaurus individual in battle at Big Rock. There would have been an incredibly easy fix to this, by the way, that would have instantly removed any of our protagonists from being at fault. And that would have been to just have the dinosaurs break open the gate themselves. After all, the tagline of Fallen Kingdom is, life finds a way. Life cannot be contained. Life breaks free. Life finds a way. But having a person externally open the gate, that's not life finding a way, that's life getting shown the way because it's incapable of doing it on its own, which kinda goes against the whole theme. Or somewhat alternatively, have the Allosaurus from Battle at Big Rock be the individual that was bought at the auction by some random millionaire. Then we could at least blame that guy on it escaping and attacking people, instead of our human protagonists which are supposed to be likeable. My second problem with the ending of Fallen Kingdom directly contradicts the first one. This is only a small handful of dinosaurs. Several of them, like Velociraptor, Carnotaurus and T-Rex, even represented by just a single individual, with no chance of reproducing. While these dinosaurs will cause casualties on small scale levels as seen in battle at Big Rock, at the same time there are so few of them that the military would just wipe them out within a year especially the big ones. I have seen comparisons to the situation in Colombia, where a small population of hippopotamuses descended from Pablo Escobar's private zoo has thrived since his death in 1993. Some people want to kill or at least sterilize the hippos as they are too dangerous for humans and the local ecosystem, while public opinion wants the hippos to be protected. This could be a really great analogy for at least the small and medium sized dinosaurs. But many Jurassic World dinosaurs are way larger and more destructive than any hippopotamus. Also, these dinosaurs are not set loose on a developing country with limited resources like Colombia, but on US soil. And the US government does have the resources to shoot at least the big dinosaurs, which also happen to be way easier to track than a hippopotamus in a swamp. So realistically, by the time of Dominion, only small and evasive saurians like the Compies and pterosaurs should be around. Maybe herbivores like Parasaurolophus if they're lucky to be left alone. And finally, there's the fact that hippopotamuses are animals that naturally exist in Africa, where they are threatened by human-caused extinction. Whereas dinosaurs have been extinct for many millions of years before humanity and thus the genetically created dinosaurs of Jurassic World should never have existed in the modern world to begin with. With all this out of the way, I can finally talk about the short film itself. Battle at Big Rock is the best pro-choice PSA I have ever seen. <laughs> The short film centers around a blended family on a camping trip in a national park in California. How do I know this is a blended family? We've been a family for two years now, okay? Because they talk in expository dialogue to each other. The youngest daughter mentions that she has been practicing with the crossbow of their camping neighbor, Greg. How you doing, Greg? Oh, you know, surviving. Best character. 
Then a Nasuto Ceratops family arrives at the campsite, and this is definitely my favorite aspect of the whole short film. Dinosaurs rummaging through people's garbage similar to what bears do. Nasuto Ceratops. Fun fact, the genus Nasuto Ceratops was officially published only in 2013. So unless this little girl has read a brand new dinosaur book, or spent a lot of time browsing Wikipedia articles, chances are pretty low that she would actually know this dinosaur's name. Maybe she recognizes it from back when it was still an attraction at the Jurassic World theme park, except there was no Nasutoceratops in Jurassic World or Fallen Kingdom, not even as a mention on any promotional website. We just have to accept the retcon that in this pile of dinosaurs there are two Nasutoceratops that just happen to be always off screen. The Nasuto Ceratops model has some cliché inaccuracies like being too large and having elephant-like feet, but the most defining feature of a Ceratopsian is its skull, and the head looks more or less like the real animal, so good job! Then the Allosaurus shows up, and again, it is way too large, but its head shape and the big lacrimal horns are clearly based on an actual Allosaurus skull. This is what bothered me about the Baryonyx model from Fallen Kingdom. It de-emphasizes its most recognizable features, which are the snout and the hands. They even bother to give the Allosaurus non-pronated hands, which is the kind of detail any non-dinosaur expert wouldn't even know unless you pointed it out to them. And in another plus, the Allosaurus tries to go after the weak baby Nasutoceratops and backs down when a second adult shows up to protect it. You know, like it's an actual animal that doesn't want to risk a fight instead of your usual movie monster. This short film might actually be perfect. Oh boy, this is my least favorite part. The baby starting to scream? Sure. But no way the mom is trying to calm it down with just nursery rhymes. <laughs> Close the curtains, put something over the baby's mouth, get it out of its seat to start running anything. <laughs> Special thanks again to Maisie Lockwood, without whom this tragedy would not have happened. Do I think for even a second that I'm about to see a ravenous dinosaur eating a human baby in this non-age restricted official Universal Pictures YouTube upload? No, but I like that the short film even put a baby in danger to begin with. In fact, this entire action scene is more tense than anything we see in the actual Jurassic World movies. We have this helpless family trapped inside their van, desperately trying to fight off a giant dinosaur with improvised weapons like metal bars and fire extinguishers, all while it slowly inches closer and closer and takes up more and more of the space inside. And despite how monstrous it appears, the Allosaurus still acts like an animal when it is temporarily stumped by electric sparks and by the fire extinguisher. I love how claustrophobic this scene feels because it's filmed from inside the van. Boy do I hope there's not a random wide shot where the dinosaur just poses for the camera. Yeah, this shot looks cool in isolation, but in the scene itself, this moment just suddenly takes you out of all the tension. It's completely unnecessary, especially when the short film ends with the camera zooming out to show the full-scale destruction anyway. Then the Allosaurus is shot by a crossbow, which is enough to make the dinosaur retreat. And I am perfectly okay with that. This moment makes it clear that this is not an unstoppable monster but an animal, and for this animal getting shot right into its face is enough to make it reconsider whether a prey item is worth pursuing. I can't believe this scene was written by the same guy who had a dinosaur ignore hot lava to attack people. I don't even mind too much that it's the little girl who saved him, because she did mention at the beginning of the short film that she has been crossbow training. Although of course the real Chekhov's gunman would have been if Greg himself had pulled the trigger. Oh you know, surviving. The credits of this short film feature other people's encounters with wild dinosaurs. And it's a nice example of world building, even if it's just Jurassic World dinosaurs put into actual real life internet videos. The CGI looks pretty convincing with the exception of one scene. And that was Battle at Big Rock, possibly the best piece of Jurassic World media so far. 
I love that this is a small scale short film publicly available on YouTube that nevertheless had the same amount of effort put into its CGI and set pieces as the theatrical movies. Being a self-contained little story also means that I can enjoy this piece of media on its own, without getting caught up in a terribly written mess that comes with the Jurassic World movies preceding it. With no weaponized hybrids in sight, the dinosaur depictions actually end up being among the best of the entire franchise. They even manage to give the Allosaurus a frightening standout action scene after its theatrical debut in Fallen Kingdom was just to immediately get smacked by a rock. Allosaurus had never seen such bullshit before. When this was released back in 2019, I decided to not review it because I thought the video would be too short, as I wouldn't have much to say about the actual film itself. Well, clearly this was not the case, and now that it's two years later, I even got an additional Jurassic World live action short film to review. But I have decided to split this video right here. <laughs> I don't know yet how long I'm gonna talk about the prologue to Dominion and how much time I wanna dedicate to the inaccuracy debates surrounding it. So I'm gonna save that video for the end of the year and at that point there will likely be a Jurassic World Dominion trailer to discuss as well. I preemptively wish you all happy holidays. Oh and fun fact, I have gone this entire video without saying a single curse word. How the fuck?